Hello, welcome to Movie Summaries. Today we are summarizing a 2021 horror, mystery, thriller movie called There's Someone Inside Your House. Fair warning, there are spoilers in this summary. Enjoy, and be sure to subscribe to watch more videos weekly, and hit like. The movie begins with a high school jock named Jack Pace returning home from school. He sets an alarm for 4pm on his phone for his football game and goes to sleep. Later, when the alarm goes off, Jackson finds an alarm clock in place of his phone. He realizes that he is late for his game and proceeds to leave, but only to find his main door open and his truck missing. Alarmed, he runs back inside and locks the door. He then calls 911, but later hangs up when he notices a picture of him and his friends in their school locker room on his fridge. He removes the picture, but only to notice a trail of more such pictures leading to his bedroom. In the pictures, Jackson is seen hazing a fellow football jock named Caleb. Suddenly, Jackson's phone starts ringing from his closet. Scared, he grabs a golf club and nervously inspects the closet, while proclaiming, whatever little game this is, whatever you think you know, you don't know shit. Frightened, he mindlessly swings the golf stick and the closet. However, it fails to connect, and a hand appears from below, and slices Jackson's ankles open with a machete. Jackson screams in pain, and collapses on the ground. The killer then appears wearing Jackson's face mask. Jackson freaks out, and explains that he didn't mean to harm Caleb. The killer ignores his pleas for forgiveness, and stabs him with a machete to death. Brutal. Meanwhile at the game, everyone receives the video of Jackson and his friends beating up Caleb in the locker room. The game comes to a standstill, and everyone stares at Caleb. So, it is safe to say that Caleb is not the killer, since he was playing at the time of the incident. The entire school is shaken by the grisly murder and link Caleb to Jackson's death, ostracizing him. However, a group of friends consisting of high school nerds, outcasts, and former popular students welcome Caleb to sit with them during lunch. The group consists of Darby, McKinney, Rodrigo, Zach Stanborn, and Alex. Their lunch is interrupted by the student body president, Katie. She delivers a speech to provide a guiding light in these trying times to her fellow students. She calls Jackson's video in death, hateful, and urges everyone to respond to hate with love. She invites every student to celebrate love tomorrow at the Holy Trinity Church for Jackson's memorial. After school, when the group proceeds to return home, they find that someone has vandalized Zach's car. Zach is the son of a conniving, an opportunistic rich farm owner hated for preying on vulnerable people and buying their land. Zach doesn't approve of his father's ways as much as everyone else. He's quite used to being targeted for being the heir to the Stanborn estate. As the group proceed to leave in Zach's car, McKinney's ex-boyfriend, Oliver Larson, gives them a middle finger and drives away. Oliver is upset set with McKinney for shooting down his attempts to get back together with her. Alex considers him a psychopath. Later that night, McKinney has dinner with her grandmother Sabrina, who has a sleepwalking problem. McKinney is stressed over her past and the repercussions it could have on her life and college application. She fears that if anyone looks up her real name on Google, she wouldn't receive university financial aid and lose her friends. Sabrina assures her that her past doesn't define her and she's going to do just fine. Before going to bed, McKinney writes poems to lift her mood. Oliver messages her, but she keeps ignoring him. McKinney wakes up in the middle of the night, thinking she heard her grandmother sleepwalking again. She checks on her to find the kitchen table set up and the outside door open. She turns around, and there is Sabrina standing behind her. Yup, she was sleepwalking again, but something spooky about this time. The next day at church, Katie is preparing Jackson's memorial by herself. Suddenly, an audio starts playing on the projector. It is an anonymous podcast, where the otherwise goody-good and virtue-signaling student body president has made controversial and ignorant statements. Afraid of being exposed, she looks around and notices is the killer, wearing her face mask. Kate tries to explain herself, but the masked assailant draws out a knife. Freaked out, she attempts to run out of the church, but realizes that she is locked inside. The killer stabs her chest open. However, she manages to get away and lock herself inside the confession booth. The killer then starts randomly stabbing the wooden booth, and Katie calls 911. However, before she gets to ask for help, the killer gets her. People arrive for Jackson's memorial and find Katie's lifeless body hanging from the ceiling. The murder shakes the town, and the police announces an 8pm curfew. With the killer exposing its victim's secret before executing them, the McKinney and other senior students with dark secrets start worrying they could be next. They are called to the police station for interrogation, where they speculate could be behind these killings. Some believe a football jock is behind these killings, while some feel Oliver is the culprit. The police is also under a lot of pressure to crack the case, as there's a referendum due next month to dissolve the police department. Zach is spared from the interrogation because his father hires a lawyer and invokes his constitutional rights. Outside, Mr. Stanford scolds his son for going to the station reeking of weed, when he is the police department's number one enemy for trying to put them out of business and acquire their land. McKinney is the last one to be interrogated. She is stuck with Oliver, as he can't go home without his deputy brother in the curfew. Oliver tries to talk to his ex-girlfriend, 
and it is revealed that Katie and him dated during the summer break. Oliver hypothesizes that she broke up with him before the school started, so as not to be seen as crazy for being with him. As it turns out, Oliver has had behavioral issues in the past, and is considered a sociopath by many. After her interrogation, McKinney decides to give Oliver another chance. They drive away by themselves, disregarding the curfew. They park the car in a quiet neighborhood, and hook up. However, they are soon interrupted by other high school seniors running to somewhere in a hurry. But fortunately, no one has been murdered. It turns out, Zack has thrown a secret party at his home, and at the party, everyone must reveal a secret. McKinney joins her friends at the party, but poor Oliver gets shooed away by Alex and Rodrigo. Darby first reveals her secret. She got the fellowship she applied for at NASA, followed by Alex, who reveals her secret and admits that she has a crush on Rodrigo. That's music to Rodrigo's ears, because he has had a major crush on Alex for a long time, but couldn't man up and express it. McKinney's secret is that she writes poetry. And lastly, Zack's secret is that he won't be able to graduate with his class. Zack then pulls out another secret, a gun. Everyone freaks out and backs off. Zack then puts the gun to his mouth and shoots himself. Fortunately, it doesn't have any bullets, and the only thing it shoots is smoke. It is a custom-made vape gun. Zack then gets on top of a table to unveil the night's main event. He acknowledges his classmates' dislike for his father, who buys up people's lands for pennies, just to grow his 30,000-plus acre of corporate empire. As a compensation, Zack reveals that he has converted Mr. Stanborn's secret vast Nazi memorabilia collection into pipes, hookahs, and bongs for them. As the teens smoke and party away, Rodrigo notices that his mother's fentanyl pills that he takes secretly are scattered all over the floor. Everyone then receives a message, exposing Rodrigo for being a junkie. Rodrigo panics, and suddenly, the lights go out. Here we go again. The killer appears, wearing Rodrigo's face mask, freaking everyone out. The teens run for the exit as the killer starts chasing Rodrigo. He manages to escape through the air vent, but the masked killer follows him outside and tases him with the taser. The killer then empties the fentanyl pills in Rodrigo's mouth and slits his throat. McKinney and her group are devastated by Rodrigo's death, and the school is suspended. McKinney seeks comfort in Oliver. Three weeks pass by, life starts to return to normalcy, and the school opens again. Alex and others brand Oliver the killer. They are sure of Oliver's guilt, because the killer used a taser, and Oliver's brother is a cop, making it easy for Oliver to steal the taser and run background checks on other students and learn their secrets. Alex also points out the odd circumstances in which Oliver's parents died. Naturally, Alex objects to McKinney's closeness with him, but McKinney brushes her concerns aside, citing lack of hard evidence against him. McKinney's grandma joins a sleep clinic program for her sleepwalking problems for which Sabrina will sleep over at the clinic at night. Later, Oliver drops by to pick McKinney up to hang out. He drives her to the middle of a cornfield. Oliver then gets on top of the car with McKinney and shows her the vast ocean-like cornfield. McKinney appreciates the gesture as a cool breeze kisses their face. McKinney reads him a poem she wrote. Let it be forgotten as the flower is forgotten. Forgotten as a fire that was once singing gold. Let it be forgotten forever and ever. Time is a kind friend. She will make us old. The two of them make out, but soon get interrupted when Oliver gets a call from his deputy brother. McKinney goes back inside the car, and to her horror, she notices a taser gun in the glove compartment. When Oliver returns to the car, McKinney asks him about his parents. Oliver reveals that they died in a car accident. Oliver's father was driving the car and died instantly, and his mother died the next day in the hospital. But Oliver miraculously survived. People suspect that it was not an accident, but a premeditated murder orchestrated by Oliver who had a history of behavioral problems. In his defense, Oliver says that when something terrible happens, people need someone to blame. He adds that no one probably gets that better than McKinney. McKinney says, hold on. Did you do a background check on me? Oliver's silence answers the question, and upset McKinney proceeds to leave. Oliver calls her out by her real name and tells her, I know who you are. McKinney takes a cab home. She is alone at home, so she barricades her door and goes to bed with a knife by her side. She wakes up later at night to find the door open and the knife and her cell phone missing. Frightened, she rushes downstairs to call 911 on the landline phone. But a recording starts playing on the phone, where McKinney is giving a statement to a judge in court. McKinney drops the phone and notices the fire burning in the next room. She nervously inspects, and finds that the room has been plastered with pictures of a badly burned girl, and McKinney's mugshot. Uh-oh. This isn't looking so good for McKinney. The killer appears wearing McKinney's face mask, and tases her. It then pours ethanol on her, and proceeds to fetch a flame. However, before the killer could set McKinney on fire, a car arrives outside her home. McKinney uses the opportunity to trip the killer over, but it manages to get back up and flee. Alex finds McKinney on the floor crying. McKinney tells her that she was right, and Oliver was behind the murders. Alex and the others receive a 
message exposing McKinney's secret. It turns out, McKinney used to play sports, and she was hazed by her seniors. They took her out camping, force-fed her alcohol, and dog food. When McKinney tried to run away, her senior named Jasmine tried to stop her, and McKinney, inebriated, pushed Jasmine into the campfire. Jasmine survived, but she got badly burned. McKinney got charged for attempted murder and went to trial. However, she eventually got acquitted, but she continued to get daily death threats. McKinney's parents blamed each other for the incident and got separated. Ashamed, McKinney moved in with her grandmother and changed her name, trying to become a different and a better person. Alex and others comfort and assure McKinney that she has become a different person, who always helps and defends people she cares about. Due to McKinney's statements, Oliver gets arrested on suspicion of being behind the multiple murders, while the town merrily welcomes its annual corn maze festival, while waiting for Alex and others to arrive outside the school so they can go to the Stanborn Corn Maze Festival. McKinney learns that Oliver has been released by his deputy brother. Seeing Oliver approaching her, she freaks out and runs into the empty school building. Inside, she bumps into Caleb and embraces him, breathing a sigh of relief. However, the killer wearing Caleb's face mask appears from behind and stabs Caleb as Oliver cries out to her from a distance. The killer then hands the bloodied machete to a numb McKinney and leaves. Oliver catches up to her and calls an ambulance for Caleb as Alex and Darby arrive. McKinney speculates that Zack could be the next target and heads to the corn maze festival with Oliver and others to warn him after failing to reach him through phone. Meanwhile, the killer is already at the festival and has set the cornfield on fire. As the group pulls up to the burning maze field, they receive a call from Zack, who tells them that he's inside the burning field looking for his father. McKinney comes up with a plan and suggests they drive their car into the burning field to clear a path for Zack and their classmates who are stuck inside. Alex and others agree and the teens drive into the field heroically. After clearing out a path, Oliver and the others get out of the car with Oliver's taser and the killer's machete. They come across a trail of blood and dead bodies and run into a group of survivors looking for a way to get out. McKinney sends Darby and Alex to escort them out of the field while she goes deep into the field with Oliver looking for Zack. They eventually come across a glade where Mr. Stanborn is pleading with the killer to spare his life. The killer is wearing Mr. Stanborn's face mask. McKinney tries to distract the killer, but it only makes the killer execute Mr. Stanborn with a sword expeditiously. To their astonishment, the killer then reveals himself to be Zack. The psychopath laments that he had prepared the perfect thing to say to his dad before killing him, and McKinney ruined that moment. Mr. Stanborn was supposed to be crying, aware of his life choices and its consequences. Oliver interrupts Zack's monologue and points the taser gun at him. Unfortunately, Oliver can't make the taser go off, and Zack, enraged, rams the sword into him. This kid is seriously crazy. McKinney tries to talk him out of killing more people, and tells him that this isn't him. However, Zack responds that she has no idea who he is. He says that he has spent his whole life denying who he is. He is ashamed that he was born into the Stanborn family. He adds that it wasn't his fault that he inherited his family ill-gotten wealth. Zack then asks McKinney if she sees now how she and others are wearing masks, a fake facade. They're all hypocrites much like his dad, who point fingers at others but are hiding dark flaws and secrets within. Zack adds that unlike others, he can't hide from his dad's last name, so he is showing the others who they are. Zack then reveals that he plans to kill McKinney and frame her for all the murders. However, Oliver suddenly gets up and tases Zack with a gun. McKinney then stabs Zack with a machete and puts an end to his madness and life. Nice move. The movie cuts to months later. McKinney and her friends get accepted into the universities of their choice. She reconciles with Jasmine, and the movie ends with McKinney ending her valedictorian speech with a moving poem. Hope you enjoyed our summary. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos weekly. Thanks.